So I'm excited to hear to be here today with Emilio. He's the uh, he's he's in charge of the passive filter project, and uh, as somebody that's working on his internship uh, with the University of Victoria, he's just, he's gracefully and very generously been um, uh, providing his time and working on not only this project but but many other projects as well. So um, publicly, I want to thank him. Uh, for all his hard work and um, today's video is actually going to go through the passive filter and discuss the project where we're at where we hope to go and um, and uh, we hope any and all listeners out there can offer um, some guidance criticism and, uh, and 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 possibly a helping hand so um, Emilio on that uh, how are you doing today well thank you so much for the introduction Daniel I'm doing pretty good really excited to talk about the project that you We've been developing or finishing up a little bit during the past couple of months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So why don't we show the screen and uh, then we'll kind of step through what the passive filter is. And so basically, what we are trying to do is make a framework so we can analyze and make really well establish the relationships between figures of authority through the passive filter that Planxy has been has been using to generate prompts. For the writer cooperative. That's right. That's right. Basically, how it works is it's just it's powered by Google, by the people have also searched for section in the browser, which here's one example. In this case, when we look up Plato, we get a little window that pops up where it comes his name, his description, and a little bit below that. Also, a section where it says people also search for, and after we click that, we get on we get a prompt to another window where Google gives us a list of twenty five thinkers that all or well not necessarily thinkers but people that have also searched for this when they look for the original query. This is actually great information since we can start since just by looking at this. Google is practically telling us that there is a relationship between these two people in terms of the consumer habits that the people have been, ha been making whenever they look up that person, right? We should clarify that uh, consumer in this case is has to do with um, just their activity on the internet. And so, you know, you might have a large portion of the people looking up Plato um, that it's far from their mind that they're actually a consumer of sorts, right? It's, it's, um, it's what they're actually, it's their search habits as opposed to consumption as we know it. Um, and quite often what the, um, the larger or for-profit corporations are looking for in terms of consumption behavior, right? They're looking to find out what our, um, uh, how to how to move our habits into uh, a purchase, right? This is is it's some of the reasons behind the algorithms, and I think this um, this algorithm is um, nice because I don't we don't use it to that end. We're we're using it as a reflection of what's going on in culture, and yeah. it seems to be fairly isolated from the um, from the monetization. Um, of 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 algorithms, right? Or the monetization that you can derive from from the from the algorithms, right? Sure. It's not like they are purchasing something with a monetary value, but I mean, after all, they're just using they're consuming Google as a product, right? Uh, they're using Google to expo to look up something, and we're just trying to find some patterns in that. Yeah, which is really useful as Google is well, a pretty much a staple in a way. People find out stuff. At least in the very initial steps, about how they start searching something up. Yeah, exactly. I like to refer to it as the the Google Oracle because um, it is an extension of our our intellect in a way, and uh, you know, it's 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 quite a marvel of our contemporary condition that we're able to look up something so so quickly. In fact, there's um, uh, the algorithm that we investigate quite intensively is the a priori algorithm, which has a, uh, uh, a, a, a deep and rich philosophical context in itself. So, um, yeah. It's also really interesting because we're 
Well, we also get this algorithm from the habits of not just some individuals, but all the users of Google, which is a very diverse population in itself, which in my opinion, that kind of validates it a little, a little bit with his findings as well. So one of the challenges that we have with this was finding a way to automate it, which we were able to do, which really also helps us as makes this model way more sustainable. And we can even start thinking about terms of doing this in a routine manner, right? We can start thinking about trying to look someone up every month, every couple of months. And even then we can start taking snapshots of culture as you have previously explained. Yeah, well, I mean, and, and I'm, not, I'm not making any kind of wild claim that this is all of culture, but I think it's a, 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 a worthwhile pursuit of a, a cultural sampling. Right. And so uh, does it focus on something that is a little bit more academic? Sure. Yes, it does. Um, does it does it point towards a classical education? Sure. Yes. Yeah. So a Western education and uh, Western influence. Sure. But I think there is a bigger narrative um, that that any listener needs to understand is that it's it's reflective of our philosophical and and cultural media outlet, which is Planksa. And Planksip is a growing entity. Um, we um, we do a lot of our ontological framework for content population um, for content creation. Our content creation strategies, sorry, are actually populated a lot by what we see in this kind of analysis. So if we see a cultural deficiency, and uh, the example I like to give is in psychology. Which, Emilio, you have an interest in psychology too, right? We'll get to that in a second. But the, the thing on, on psychology is that there's, um, I think, three standard um, entry points of people that come into mind when somebody's starting in the field of psychology. And that is Sigmund Freud, uh, Jung, and um, uh, Wilhelm Wundt. Now, the issue with somebody like Wilhelm Wundt, who's been named as the father of, of psychology, is that he doesn't have, uh, he seems to be the like the least popular out of the three. And yet his tradition is the one that was born, or the, his tradition is one that was more, had more of an emphasis on empirical study, measuring um, reactions by people with a, a weight in their hand or, you know, how they sense and perceive things. And so... Um, I see this as a deficiency in culture, and so we uh, spend some time emphasizing and researching um, Wilhelm Wundt and and some of his work, popularizing it if 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 need be, right? Trying to have honest conversations about this because we see the deficiency and we think that there's a a need to um, you know to promote that material. And it's really interesting as well because. We can say that there is a deficiency, and even that it may seem a little subjective, but we can even start studying that, right? Especially when we consider that the Google algorithm is made on conditional probability. So, for example, thanks to the passive filter, we can see, oh, people that look up these people, when you look up these people, all the people show up. And then after we do that a lot of times, we can start comparing them with each other. And that's how we can find those deficiencies in the, well, in the, in the system of browsing, right? That's the important thing to understand is that we do that. And um, I think I, um, I implemented it into a, um, a content creation strategy um, for PlankSip overall. But also, I, um, in its inception, I also was looking for a framework to analyze books and literature. And that's one of the other important things that I'd like to talk about in today's show is that... Um, I've done a few case studies and I, you know, Emilio, you've worked on some projects as well. Um, we look at, um, at books and indexes in particular. Now there's nothing saying that we couldn't do a text sampling from chapters, but sometimes that gets a little bit, you'd be surprised. It gets actually a little bit um, amb ambiguous. And the reason is because some books have, extensive prefaces or epilogues or different kinds of structure. And then it's, it's kind of like, well, should we include that or not include that? And then, so you need this kind of standardization of rules. And although I'm very flexible with the rules and kind of, and I can approach a certain uh, textual comparison 
uh, with, with say, different base parameters, I'm still doing it in an experimental type of way. And I'm, I'm saying, okay, here's how the experiment is, is set up. Here's how I'm collecting the data. Here's how I'm going to, um, uh, you know, basically set up the framework. And then the key point of difference is that once we have that baseline in a, in a, in a literary format or referring to a literary title, um, we can, um, we can do a, uh, uh, like a critique. Okay. On the, on the book. Um, and we can see where the emphasis of the particular book is in terms of names. We find that names are the easiest ones. And it, besides it plays nicely into that cliche of standing on the shoulders of giants. So the system itself is something that I'd like to see become more commonplace within an academic environment. And uh, what we're doing here is laying the foundation for some of these, um, you know, types of this type of framework. Um, Planksip being a media outlet and a publishing agency, what we're actually doing is we take it further with the creative prompts and we actually have our members write um, on uh, the creative prompts of, of uh, uh, quotations, mm -hmm. so, so to speak. Right. And so um, this happens with an intake of, of a lot of our writers and this helps us assess whether or not they're you know, ready to be a writer uh, and communicate some of the wisdom that's in the quotes, right? And so we're actually encouraging the development of that writer's voice, right? That creative, unique perspective um, that's hopefully anchored in, a, in, in, in some strong foundations. So it's all part and parcel for us. What we're looking for in terms of academic cooperation is some oversight and some more concrete examples of working with um, a, a lab or a department, um, you know, to further develop the passive filter. For sure. Basically, what we made is we already have the machine ready in a way, right? We already know what kind of inputs we can give. And we already know that the output that is going to be is going to be just the relationships based on the, well, from what constitutes it itself. So right now, we just have to be looking for what we can fit to this little system model that we have going on that is the plugin, the passive filter. Right. Like, like Daniel said, we have done this in, well, in different case studies. First of all, we have done it with the plugin writers, which has worked pretty great. It's, and in as a more concrete example, we have been able to do it with the indexes of books, as Daniel has mentioned. And that's really great as well, because in a way, it's kind of a table of contents. As a writer starts mentioning an author in their book, they're also referencing his, the ideas of this previous person. And by using a plank set filter on them, we can start studying the relationships between them. And moving that, we can even use a little bit of mathematical theory in order to show that as a network, which is really great because we can start mapping those connections which again is very much of high significance because we move on from a type of data that it has no numeric value, but, we, but instead of focusing on any kind of quantitative well, value, we're starting to focus on the relationships they have between each other and how they, they relate to each other as well. Yeah, and I've, um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not sure, Emilio, what to do with the the graphical representations like you've been able to put it into a, a 3d environment we can zoom in and spin and look and so it's a very visual uh interaction and um i'm open to ideas on how we can actually move that forward with um you know that graphical interface i know you're using the um the probability program r or programming language you're using that to develop um a, a lot of these models. Um, why don't you spend a little bit of time just explaining about about that? For sure, it might be a, it might seem a little bit almost useless at the beginning to you. Oh, okay, we can show this information in a network, but what about it, right? But even then, it's super important because it's not just that, but it's the way that it's structured. What we're trying to say is that there is a connection between people, and that we can even start forming communities about how they're clustered together. And we can even start in asking more interesting questions about, okay, so how does this, does this structure from this book differ from this other structure? What communities do they have in common? Um, 
how come, well, it seems, for example, in the screen, we can see how some of these communities are very isolated from each other. And we can start asking questions about why and start to start looking at those cultural deficiencies we were talking about in the beginning. I would point out too that with our idea of a, 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 a structured and updating a sequentially updating database that we may not even have to take an initial snapshot and dig into the question why, just as an alternative, right? Is that we then look at how it's changing over time. So we're focusing more on the Delta. So if, for example, these outliers here, and I'm, uh, I don't know if they're on a bell curve an outlier or not, but whatever, the clustering of the groups outside of that main, main core, you're looking at those and say, you know, what if over time you see that it grows and connects in with the main group? Exactly. That is something that this is where this should be exciting somebody. This is where if, if we can see that and map that and track that over time or between different um, collections of books, say, for example, or one book between another book. Right. And we can see that our epistemological understand or like our understanding, our collective cultural understanding, the emphasis is changing. Um, and now it's just pure speculation as to what and how that's actually changing. But there is a way for us to, you know, open up that dialogue and say, okay, now we have some interesting data here. What's, you know, what's going on. Right. And so um, I think that that's just a, uh, my, my hope is that this is a tool that can be used as, as a baseline. Uh, one potential baseline. And, and I think the comparison is in economics. Um, we, we're we not putting forward a claim that has anything causal because this is just search habits. What we're doing is to say it's a purely relational database and, you know, something like a, a rolling 12, 10 uh, day moving average, say, for example, in, a, in, a, in an economic model, it's, it becomes a, a way, a metric of measuring, a baseline. It's not predictive in any other way because it, it just shows a trend. Mm -hmm. And so this is what we're trying to see is large scale trends based off of the search habits of people that happen to be interested in this. The key is that we're, we're relating that visualization to a specific group of authors in a book in a, in, a, in, the, in a book or comparing two books and seeing how that changes over time. So we couldn't be more excited about um, this kind of technology and essentially what we're we're trying to do is actually introduce this to academic institutions and um, very gracefully allow the academic institution to come and provide some oversight to our project, let's grow it, let's, you know, let's, let's, let's put some validity to this and make it something that would um, benefit not only the wider audience, but also the academic institutions would be the ideal for me. And I also think it's really interesting that we're not the only ones who are trying to use some computational models in social sciences. There's been plenty of examples where people have been trying to map the interest of people in the internet or the in interest of people in these models. For example, there's even some laboratories back in, all around Canada who are already focusing on that, even though they're more focused in the way they structure and how they measure the distance between the clusters, right? But what I'm trying to say is that we're not trying to, we're trying to just bring more to the field as well. We're not trying to make a new one as well. Yeah. And you know what? Um... On that note, I think really that's a really great summary. Emilio, do you think so as well? Or do you think we should spend some time on our case studies? For sure, we can move on to our case studies. Okay. So for our first case study, we took the work of Plato Complete Works by Cooper and Hutchinson in 1997. And then through some, a bit of the automation of the Planck's filter, we were able to extract the field, the index of the book and then just run it through the filter. And we were left with a huge list. And then after kind of tailoring a little bit and just pruning it almost, 
we were able to get a really fine list that even before we start thinking about it in terms of a network, we can start building a more simple structure and start thinking about the composition of the index, which is shown in this little pie chart here. Well, so you took a slight variation, though, Emilio, on this. I remember you took the initiative on, on actually, um, because this is other rich information that shows up in the schema.org um, on, on, the, on, the, on the Google site. And so this shows the breakdown of uh, everybody from the, the labels of philosopher uh, to playwright. And that's interesting how that breaks down with, with the names mentioned in the, in the index, right? For sure. In this case, for example, we can say that 20% of the people mentioned in the index were philosophers. And I think that's in itself super interesting. After that, we can see, oh, 11% of them were poets, poets, 7% of them were heroes. So we can even see that there's a bit of uh, influence on that. Yeah, and I'm not saying that the, the Google um, classifications for are, are set in stone either, but it would be interesting just in a, con in a, a contemporary comparison to how we refer to them in terms of such a fragmented, um, uh, you know, form here. And then we have what, what the, um, uh, the actual ancient Greek, um, you know, would actually refer to them as, right? I mean, y you know, it's, it's it, like, are we assigning more identity or less identity? It just, it does get a little bit in a gray area because, because it's from Plato, it's, it's a, um, it's a dialogue, so there's characters, right? That's why we have people like the father, the son, the musician, the actor, the artist, right? Yeah. So it, it's just, I think it's an, it's an interesting one. I can't do much with it um, unless I was trying to do a comparison between, uh, you know, contemporary and ancient times and see how we actually you know, build characters to tell that much kind of information, right? There's, I don't know, there's something cool we could do with it, but I think on its surface, it's more just interesting. For sure. I think, for the way, it kind of gives an introduction of what are the stuff that we're studying. Because the people who are mentioned in this index are the ones that are going to be fed into the, into what ne into the network. Right, right, right. It's kind of like just leads us to our next step. Because all of these people are the ones who are being fed into the filter. And, well, we are ultimately made, left with this huge list. And even then, it's really interesting because we can... So every time you put, run someone through the filter, you get 25 responses. So if you run 200 of those people, you're obviously going to get a lot of repetition, which is what we refer to as instances, which is really um, interesting metric because in a way, it kind of refers to how many the times a uh, figure is being reference in the index itself, right? Mm -hmm. And now that we it shows a cumulative, it shows a cumulative emphasis on it, right? So there's the first level or there's the first level, which would be just the people from the index. Mm -hmm. And then there's a second order of the ones that would show up in the passive filter. So and this has to do with like a cultural um, information Cor correlation, really, basically, right? And so I've even, and I didn't tell you this, I've actually done third order, fourth order, fifth order. You imagine how those arrays would absolutely blow up, right? So I could take the complete list of an index, run it through the passive filter, come up with a, you know, one single column, right? And then I could run it again, and then I could run it again, and I could run it again. And I could see how far it starts to disintegrate and how quickly it disintegrates into very little repeat re repeatable patterns or whether larger patterns of people actually emerge uh, through a second pass, a third pass, a fourth pass, right? The data sets and the computational power, it gets, gets um, kind of runs away with itself, but you know, lots of ways we can use this technology, I think. Yeah. And especially even if we get this um, huge amount of information, then we can start pruning it a little bit. We can start, just reducing it to the mo to the people who have to, that show up the most, right? Yeah. Which leads up leads up to the next event, which is what we did here. And another huge advantage of representing this information in networks is that there is a concept that is called of centrality in it. And there's a lot of different ways that you can define centrality. 
Is it the one that is has the most connections? Is it one that helps to bridge different parts of the graph together? And more or less, there's just different metrics that refer to each of these different definitions. But we can use those in our analysis. So for example, in here, we took a we took a look at the betweenness scores, which is just the ability of a node that is a point to serve as a bridge between different parts of the graph. So if there's a people mentioning index that are not as popular as others, what are one of the, the people that connect both of those groups together? That's what this score refers to. And we can start thinking about that in those terms. And by doing that, and just grabbing the score, the nodes that have the highest of these scores, we essentially just prune a network, which I find really, well, I really like that analogy just because of, I feel like it refers almost to a brain. We're talking about, we're just talking about all the connections that there is and how it just starts cutting the connections that are pruning the connections that are not that important. And, and once we start pruning a network between top instances, which is how many times they appear, and the between us, which is their ability to connect different groups together, we can get an idea of what are the most important figures in the whole index. And we can even get it from this even further by focusing on intersection, that is the people that show up in both of these lists. And once we do that, we essentially have a very condensed list of the people who are the most, um, it's kind of, maybe you'll be able to help me out, but it's kind of hard to come up with a word to describe it, but the most prevalent people in the index, I would say. Well, you know what? I, I I have an idea for you, and I I'm I'm hoping we can insert this just as as a as a fun little inter interlude to our presentation here. But um, <clears throat> one one project I'd like you to add to this, if possible, is um, when you're when you're identifying the people in the passive filter and you're running the the collection of names, right? Mm -hmm. Is there a way that you can put the dates and then have the person show up as either um, being born before or after them, right? And so the re the reason why I'm thinking is that if we had a thinker like um, uh, I don't know, let's say Alfred uh, North Whitehead, right? Because he brought up that reference of footnotes to Plato. So let's say that he's in there. Now we we wouldn't use somebody that was born after him or wasn't contemporary in his life um, to say that it it was representative in this in this data set. So somehow we need to do a collection strategy, extraction tech uh, some sort of extraction method where we would say did that person know of that person? And obviously, if they weren't born until after they died, they wouldn't have any any knowledge of them at all, right? Exactly, yeah. Okay, so that would be, the I think, the cutoff point, is that someone that's born after that person is dead is excluded from, you know, that's part of an initial pruning. So the reason, and this is the reason why it came up as an idea is we were talking about centrality. So the centrality of that one particular person being in the index has this dendritic branch of people and influences that went on through in history. Now we're just using the passive filter to say, here are the ones that are the popularized people in relation to that person. Does it tell the complete story? Maybe, maybe not. From the eyes of that particular person referenced in the index, who knows, right? And so that would be interesting to have a whole series of those centrality starting points and then move that into a network and see how the centrality actually groups together into one larger centrality, right? Absolutely. Once we have the master network of a graph, being completely honest, the possibilities are limitless. We can come up with an endless amount of different methods to just prune according to what we're trying to study, which is another huge advantage of this framework that we've been developing. Yeah, and I think, I mean, we could do it as an entire book, we could do it chapter by chapter, and that's something that we could do by extracting the page numbers and then, you know, writing a program that says between this page and this page, it's, right, and so you can actually get a, um, I guess, a pretty structural approach to the way the, the text is structured, right, I mean, you know, at least from emphasis, um, 
what this has done for me, I'll tell you, as a, somebody that thinks a lot, it philosophizes a lot, incredibly creative, but I'm also, it's necessary for me to set up structure and rules. And so this is where this developed from. Um, uh, I think on its own, if I was just a structural thinker, this would come up very empty and vacuous. But uh, for me, on a personal note, when I approach text like this and I put some sort of structure in place, it helps me know where either the blind spots are or where the author is emphasizing. And so, sure, I can read the title from A to B, front to back, uh, but I can also do other ways of, of interacting with the text. And this provides more of a framework for me to, to go in like a, um, a non-invasive, like, well, macroscopic, I guess, operation to go into certain points and try and look at things in, in isolation um, and then do some comparison with my own structure of, of extraction and population. Um, the other aspect that I'd say that I take advantage of quite often, and I urge every, every uh, young, old, and aspiring creative to do is when you are immersed in these texts, when you're looking at this sort of stuff, this structure is just the surface. We're actually wanting to get into the actual text itself, extract and really understand what those wisdom points of propagation that have been so um, wonderful and maybe, you know, taken sort of deleteriously through, through history have had maybe even some bad consequences. Sure. Um, there's lots of examples of that, how, you know, some of the works are maybe not interpreted properly or we, you know, gloss over certain people and this is about research. It's about researching what, what, legacies and information and value of, of literature we have in front of us, right? For sure. And we can even think about it in terms of another very practical implication of this system, which is, again, staying with the topic of studying the index of books, but maybe start thinking about the textbooks that are presented to studying students, in, which is kind of what we did in our third case analysis. Oh, I was so excited by that. And this is a really important one to be able to show what institutions and people, I think, to set that up. We're on the West Coast. You're at University of Victoria and Planksip as a media outlet um, and publishing company. We're also on the West Coast here as well. So, yeah, Emilio, why don't you go to that and show the concentric circles of uh, some major universities here? So for sure. Basically, it's kind of the same idea that we did. We grab, a, we grab different textbooks, we extracted the index from them, and we run them through the filter. However, in this case, we did it with UBIC, UBC, and SFU. In this, like you said, just because we're centered in the west coast of Canada, and just because they also present a very good opportunity for analysis. In this case, due to my background, I decided to browse online for these core syllabus of introductory classes to psychology and use those textbooks for the our analysis, which all of them were different, which is, oh, again, very interesting as they are major institu institutions, very close to each other, one would think with a very similar audience, and yet using very different books. Once we struck the filters, we can start thinking about it in a very, not different, but in a not so similar way to the one we were thinking about, where we start comparing just the original list of the index between each other. So in this case, we have three different circles, each one representing the index of a uh, different university, UBIC, SFU, and UBC. And we can start seeing, uh, there's obviously a little bit of an overlap between the people that they reference. Also, they also differ in size. SFU textbook mentions a whole amount of people. Meanwhile, UBC selects a handful of people. And we can start focusing on, people, on the overlap between these circles. And more importantly, I think that this brings a very interesting area of study, which is, well, obviously the intersections, but the intersections between the other groups of universities that a certain university, that sounds a little bit confusing, but let's take, for example, UBIC. There are some books that UBIC and UBC reference to that, that UBIC and UBC have in common. But 
also some that UBC and SFU have that UBIC doesn't. And I think it's a very interesting question of why it doesn't. How come there is some people that are just not being including, included in the introductory classes to e psychology? And it's a bit of an area of opportunity for this for study for these people. Or what do you think, Daniel? I do, and I don't know how far we actually took that. Um, I know that was a really exciting point uh, for you, um, and I, I do agree. I think it's a really interesting one because, you know, you have something like University of Victoria, and why are there certain, um, you know, thinkers? Well, essentially, that's what would make it unique and different from the other two universities, which is a, a stronger statement than saying SFU is different from University of Victoria because you have this other comparison. Now, I think the thing about this example is that we're using a sample text of one, if I, if correct me if I'm wrong, but one primary text. Is that right? Yeah. For each of them. And so the, you know, does it extrapolate? Does it continue if, if we go through a, a whole curriculum? Do we still see such a, such a, a wide sampling from textbooks chosen by SFU? Does it differ by department with philosophy and psychology or, you know, what I'm saying? So there's such an opportunity to use this structure to analyze the differences in the relationships. And then that's the starting point too in time, because you can also monitor it over time. And when you monitor it over time, you can see where things change, right? And where opportunities lie or where differences are. And of course, as a philosopher myself, where I see irony, where I see differences, I want to go and explore those differences, right? But I think that's what you're mostly excited about. So like, let's see, let's see um, where the University of Victoria is, for example, right? Because you're paying to be at the University of Victoria. This is where you're taking your degree. So you'll go over to that X, between SFU and UBC and go, that's interesting in psychology. How come those thinkers are not part of my curriculum? Exactly. Is what am I missing out here? If anything, right? No, exactly. I think those are the terms that we should start thinking about. And especially because we are able to extract a list of those people. Maybe, and it's not like it's a lost case as well, right? Maybe an instructor could find a way to implement these figures of thought into the, the course outline. But in my experience, professors tend to stay pretty much the structure of a textbook. Oh, yeah, for sure. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But if, 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 if some sort of um, compelling and summarized, um, I guess, snapshot of information could come to them in a way that they're like, hey, yeah, that makes sense. We may not be representing the, you know, a, a complete and accurate picture to our students. I would imagine that they would be receptive to that, right? And here's the thing. That's not the only reason why we're doing it. Um, I think it helps our standpoint to know if we're reporting, right, information or publishing information that is um, as unbiased as possible, right? I mean, we're still young in a, in a media outlet sort of growth. And so we're definitely more emphasis. We have more emphasis on a Western philosophy. So there's inherently some bias there. But when we try and tackle a project, we try and do it with these objective frameworks. And I think that's kind of the idea that we're trying to encourage and bring to a university lab situation and setting. Right. So mm -hmm. that's that's what I hope to convey that's the biggest message that I hope to convey with this walkthrough and, and just kind of highlights of where we're at on the project. We need the help of the universities. We're looking for uh, the academic oversight. We're looking for them to engage with Planksip, both myself and Emilio, if he's interested, and we can gather a team together. We'd love to get involved, right? And that was the main thrust of the presentation. Um, did you have any more points on here that you wanted to go through, Emilio? Not really. I feel like we pretty much encapsulated everything that we've been doing and just gave a very brief introduction and mentioned all the huge amount of opportunities there is to study as well. That's right. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. I want to thank most of all and most importantly, my main man, Emilio, because he has put so much work into this. 
And it hasn't been a workload of drudgery. He's really, and I can attest to this, he's really enjoyed it. He's been excited and pumped to do this. So, um, you know, I, I couldn't be happier for both of us. Um, it was an honor to work with you on this project, Emilio, and we'll see where it goes. Thank you so much, Daniel. I can say the same thing. Okay. Thanks, Emilio.